Hello young programmers, welcome to our YouTube channel, where we make learning fun and easy. Today, we're gonna dive into the fascinating world of programming paradigms. Don't worry if that sounds complicated, because we're gonna break it down using simple analogies and real-life examples. Are you ready? Different programming paradigms are different ways of writing and thinking about your code. Using the right paradigm can make your code easier to read, write, and understand. It's like using the right tool for the job. Just like a hammer is good for hitting nails and a screwdriver is good for turning screws, different programming paradigms are good for different types of problems. Learning more about programming paradigms helps you become a better problem solver. It gives you more tools to choose from so you can find creative solutions. Today, we'll be talking about the four main programming paradigms that you will see most often, starting with OOP. So, OOP stands for Object Oriented Programming. Imagine you want to represent a car in your code. One way you might go about doing so would to declare some variables regarding the properties of the car. In this example, we declare two variables for the name of the car and the color of the car. Then, to represent the movement of the car, we might want to print out a statement indicating that action. We can change the attributes of the car by directly mutating the variables that we have set. That's all fine and dandy, but what if I now want to add another car with a different name and color? I will need to copy over all the code and make sure all the variable names are different for each car while maintaining naming conventions. There must be a better way of representing such objects in code. In the real world, objects have different unique characteristics and behaviors. For example, a car object has attributes such as color, brand, model. Its behaviors include moving, honking, and changing its speed. In programming, we can create templates of cars called classes. Classes are like blueprints or templates that allows us to create multiple instances of the same type. Let me show you some code. Instead of declaring different variables for each attribute of the car, we can create a car template. And within the template, we can define it to contain the attributes we want. In this case, the init or initialize method defines each car to have a brand and a color. To represent behaviors of the car such as honking, we can define methods or functions within the class templates. The difference between functions and methods are really just that methods are a representation of the behaviors in classes. Within the methods of move and honk, we can access the object's attributes such as the color and the brand. Once we have that template, we can initialize the car objects from the template. Note that the arguments passed to the car template will be set as its attributes as shown here. We can then call the methods of the car object directly through a function call. OOP allows us to organize our code into reusable and modular pieces called objects. It promotes code reusability, making it easier to maintain and update large projects. OOP also helps us model real-world scenarios like creating car objects or managing user accounts by encapsulating data and behaviors within objects. Now, let's talk about declarative programming. Imagine you ask your friends to help you build a Lego house. Instead of telling your friend each step to build the house, you give them a picture of the finished house. Declarative programming is like that picture. You describe the result you want, not the steps to get there. Declarative programming works when you describe what you want the program to achieve and the computer figures out how to do it efficiently. In this case, the picture is the desired outcome, and your friend is responsible for finding the most efficient way of achieving that outcome through Legos. One popular example of the declarative library is React. React is a JavaScript library used for building user interfaces. It allows you to describe how your UI should look at at any given moment, and React takes care of that, and React takes care of updating the UI when things change. Here's a simple code snippet to demonstrate. In this React code, we have a welcome message component that accepts a name prop and renders a personalized greeting. All we need to do is declare the HTML code that we want to show on the browser. We don't need to worry about manually updating the DOM or handling complex UI updates under the hood. React actually looks at the code and calls custom functions to manipulate the DOM and optimize the re-rendering process. But it takes care of all that behind the scenes, making it easier to build interactive user interfaces to better understand declarative programming. Let's take a look at the antithesis, imperative programming. Looking back at the Lego example, instead of giving you the big picture of the final result, I'm going to micromanage your every step and tell you exactly where and how to assemble each Lego piece. Hey, stack the red 4x2 block onto the blue 2x2 block. That is the essence of imperative programming. It is the opposite of declarative programming. To demonstrate the difference better, let's look at the example of React. In the previous section, we see that React abstracts away the UI description in the form of JSX, which is the HTML-like syntax where we could also inject JavaScript code into it. All you had to do was tell React the shape of the HTML code, and it would do all the heavy lifting for you. But the heavy lifting process is exactly what imperative programming is about. Let's uncover the imperative process that React does for us. To create a HTML with the correct content, we must first manually create the H1 element. Then, we set the inner HTML of that element to whatever we want. Lastly, we append this H1 node to the actual document body. This is the perfect contrast between declarative and imperative programming. Imperative programming is about telling the code exactly what to do to achieve what you want, whereas declarative code is about giving the big picture. If imperative programming is such a hassle and could leave room for mistakes in the precise logic, why and when will we need to program imperatively? Imperative programming is valuable when we need precise control over the execution flow. It is used in game development where we utilize heavy custom logic by explicitly stating each step. 
we can have more control over how our code executes. Finally, let's discover functional programming. Imagine you have a box that takes in some ingredients, processes them, and gives you a new food as an output. Functional programming is like using this magical box to transform data without changing the original input. It focuses on writing functions that don't have side effects and are predictable. In most programming language, there exists a concept called an anonymous function. It is a function that is not bound to a name. Anonymous functions are small inline functions that can be defined without using the function keyword in that language. They are typically used for simple one-line operations. Let's take Python for example. We can create an anonymous function by using the lambda keyword. The lambda function takes in a single parameter x and returns the result of x times 2. In other words, it takes an input x, multiplies it by 2, yielding the output. In this example, the lambda function is assigned to a variable my lambda. Then, we call the lambda function with the argument 5, which is multiplied by 2 inside the lambda function. The result 10 is then stored in the result variable. Finally, we print the value of result, which outputs 10 to the console. Let's look at how we can utilize the power of Python lambdas to create simple yet powerful code. The map function applies the lambda function, lambda x, x times 2, to each element of the iterable passed as the second argument. In this case, it's the list 1, 2, and 3. In this case, the lambda function takes an input x and multiplies it by 2, returning the result. So basically what it does is that it applies the lambda function to each of the item in the list that we pass in to the map function. And if you notice, functional programming actually encourages a declarative style. Instead of telling the code step by step on looping through the list and multiplying each number by 2, we tell the code to take a list and a function. The code then figures out what it needs to do to loop through the list itself. Here's the imperative version of the same code. In functional programming, you describe what you want to achieve by specifying the relationships and transformations between data rather than describing the specific steps to perform. Once you understand how to read declarative code, it is often much cleaner and easier to write. So, in this video, we have learned about the four programming paradigms. I hope that this has given you a good introduction and has helped you.